I'm so excited to be together again, you and me together in the Holy Spirit. Thank God for His precious Holy Spirit that unites our heart in the reverential awe of the living God. Precious Heavenly Father, we're grateful. We're so thankful for that this is the day that you've made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, we come to your word expecting. We know that you make great promises to us, but we want to get our antenna up and receive from you. So right now, in the name of Jesus, have your precious Holy Spirit on assignment to teach, unfold, reveal the heavenly scrolls of your promises and blessings in our life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We receive it. How to have part four good things. That's what this is called, how to have part four good things. This is such an exciting series and a very practical application of God's principles. I probably could do four or five more episodes on this theme, but with this segment, we're going to wrap up our series on how to have with good things, how to have good things. In Matthew 6, Jesus was speaking to the crowd and he said this, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, things shall be added unto you. And he dropped this verse in the context of talking about everything from clothing, food, good deeds, money, crops, wealth, good things, you know, this the stuff that people need every day and they were worried about being able to obtain for their families, their children. Yes, God is very interested in you getting the intangible spiritual forces like love, faith, hope, joy, peace, all that good stuff too. It's essential to life, but the Lord also talks about the nitty gritty tangible provisions necessary like housing, food, clothing, and money to pay your tax bill. Jesus said, my father knows you need these things. God is aware you need good things, and he is also aware that you need to know how to have so that you can possess all these good things. Too often, people have tried to pull from a false belief or a twisted doctrine that puts things, stuff, anything with matter in an evil category. Building a belief that somehow things are of no interest or value to an invisible, holy God but that's just word ignorance, word illiteracy. Colossians 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him, that is, by his activity and for him. And he himself existed and is before all things, and in him all things hold together. His is the controlling, cohesive force of the universe. Man, that's encouraging. Oh, this should get you excited. Jesus created all things. Did you hear that? In Jesus, all things hold together. He's the connective power and the force that holds together all matter, the controlling, cohesive force of the universe. So relax. God wants you to have love and joy, but he also wants you to have your bread and your honey, your work assignment, a place to live, clothes for your children, and oh yes, some clothes for you too, please for the love of bread and honey, how to have some clothes for you. But did you know when Jesus put off all of his deity and heavenly wealth, he still wore a seamless garment that was so nice the soldiers wanted to gamble for it? He still took 20,000 plus people out for lunch. Sure, it was only non-GMO bread and fresh caught fish, no carrot cake, but it was still a great lunch for 20,000 people. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. You might ask, well, what does this have to do with knowing how to have good things? Great question. If you don't understand fundamentally that God wants you, his will is for you to have good things, your belief will short circuit your receiver. 
The enemy of your soul puts very little work into stopping you from receiving. He puts most of his energy into stopping you from perceiving. What you perceive decides what you believe determines what you receive. So the devil doesn't spend a whole lot of time sabotaging the shipping because that would bring him face to face with Jesus and his angels. That terrifies him. He works on screwing up the order form. That's at the perceiving stage, the initial order stage. If the devil can wiggle his lies into your perception, your order forms will always have errors. So kind of like filling out an Amazon order online, you might even put in the correct name, but you keep filling in the wrong street number, a wrong city. Instead of OH for Ohio, you put in ON for Ontario. I mean, it's close, right? God knows my heart. He knows what I need. I, I, I can tolerate a little bit of crookedness, can I? Just a little misdirection and error. What's the matter? What's the problem, everybody? I told you in part three, this is truth. Hosea 4, 6. My people, God says, are destroyed for lack of knowledge or messing up the order form. You don't know, you don't go. That's Bible 101. Albert Einstein said this. The world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. A refusal to know a refusal to perceive. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Sincere ignorance. We've embraced it far too long, my friend. So what's the answer? P-B-R. How to have good things requires the opposite of ignorance. P-B-R. And it begins with your perceiving. How good you see, hear, comprehend, understand. Over and over in this series, we have discussed the Bible genius of the PBR principle. Perceive to believe to receive. Perceive bad, receive bad. Perceive good, receive good. Your perception ultimately becomes your reception. Why? Because how you perceive something is how you believe something is the outcome of how you receive that something. For example, and you know I'm giving you rubber hits the road type of practical application. If you perceive intimacy as perverted, you believe intimacy as perverted, you receive intimacy in a context of perverted. It's a distorted, ungodly, broken lifestyle that hurts people. On the other hand, if you perceive love as patient and kind, you believe love is patient and kind, you receive love as patient and kind. You actually live in that outcome of love, true love. The PBR principle of God's word applies to good and evil, the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. He will not allow himself to be ridiculed, nor treated with contempt, nor allow his precepts to be scornfully set aside. For whatever a man or a woman sows, this and this only is what he or she will reap. Now, for all my critical thinkers who wisely apply 1 John 4, 1 and test the spirit of a teaching, because even Jesus warned us that there are many false prophets and teachers among us, so... You should test the spirit of this teaching to see if it's really from God. You might be asking, well, maybe the context of Mark 4.25 restricted Jesus' remarks to being only about spiritual revelation and not things. In other words, maybe this whole to him who has more will be given and to him that doesn't have even what he does have will be taken away. Maybe that's just in regard to invisible spiritual things, not stuff, tangible things, relationships, money, business. Is that possible? Well, Take a look at what Jesus said to punctuate a parable in Matthew 25 about a man who had three stewards and put them over his property. In the story, this man had three servants, employees, in a certain country, so he divides up his property for them to manage. One was put over five talents worth, the second was put over two talents, and the third was assigned to one talent. The man then left the country for a long time, the Bible says. When he returned, he wanted an accounting of his stuff. 
The steward over five turned it into 10. So the master said, well done. You've been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of much. Enter into and share the joy which your master enjoys. The second steward doubled his investment and presented four talents back to the master. He gets the same well done promotion. Then the last guy does the exact opposite of the other two. He buries his stewardship opportunity in fear. And so he presented the same talent back to the boss, unchanged, no investment or growth. The master calls him wicked, lazy, idle, and throws him out into darkness and misery. So think of this. Jesus is talking about stewarding stuff, talents, representing tangible worth, money, estate stuff. Listen to the exact words of Jesus as he punctuates this entire story. Matthew 25, verse 29. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will be furnished richly so that he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away, my friend. It's basically word for word what Jesus said in Mark 4, verse 25, but a different context. In Mark 4, Jesus is talking about seed and harvest. Here in Matthew 25, the context is stewardship and investment of things, stuff. The punctuation is the exact same, though, because this is a universal law in principle. Whether we're talking about the visible or the invisible, the tangible or the intangible, whether we're talking about stewarding your dollars or stewarding your words. This principle of God's word is unchanging. It works for your kids and it'll work for your joy. To him or her that has, more will be given. To him or her that doesn't have, even what they do have will be taken away. PBR, what you perceive is what you believe is what you receive. Now, I can assure you, you're already working this principle, whether you know it or not. If you're receiving bad in a particular area, you're already perceiving bad and believing bad. I know it's convicting. Believe me, I've been very convicted by this truth, this profound truth. But don't let your heart be troubled or condemned. This is why God tells us truth to set us free, to promote us, to work the PBR. A precious woman came to me and Pam one day asking for prayer. She seemed downhearted and upset. She said she just felt alone, excluded, overlooked. As she talked, our hearts were moved with sadness for her. She was too precious to be overlooked and not included. Just then, her cell phone rang, and she said she had to quickly take the call. When she answered her phone, it was on speaker. Sitting there, I could hear plainly the greeting of the other woman on the phone, and she said, Hello, friend. And the conversation continued as she put the phone into private mode and spoke of plans for the next minute or two. After she got off the phone, I gave it a few minutes and then I asked, did you hear what that person said to you on the phone? She didn't seem to understand what I was pointing at. I said, did you hear what that woman called you when you answered the phone? She looked at me blankly. She said, hello, friend. Did you hear that? The woman looked at me and Pam. She thought for a moment and then she said, I didn't even hear that, but you're right. That's what she said. Quickly, the woman smiled and began to process that she wasn't alone, excluded, or overlooked. She had been tricked into turning off her perceiver. She turned off her believer and in so she turned off her receiver. She had lost her God ability how to have. She felt had and sad until she began to have again. We all need correction. That means we all need coaches, spiritual leaders, people with a pastoral calling, an apostolic anointing to help us see and hear what we're not perceiving. Look, God wants to talk directly to you, but we all need antenna repair once in a while. Too many believers have been completely tricked, deceived into dimming their lights and shutting off their ability on how to have. God never has a problem transmitting, my friend, but humanity does have a problem with broken receivers, turned off receivers, wrong channel receivers, neglected receivers, fake and pretend believers that aren't really receivers. Well, if the Lord just wanted me to receive, he'd just drop it here for me. Lord, if you want me to have muscles, oh, no. Oh, okay. Okay. 
guess it's not your will, Lord, for me to have muscles. That's like saying if the Lord wanted me to eat the banquet, he'd have somebody chew up the food and stick it in my mouth. Now that's crazy and gross. It's awful. (laughs) I said in part three, referencing the book of Exodus, it says the Lord has set before you the promised land, but you have to possess it. You've got to have it. You've got to receive it. God will help you perceive. He'll help you believe, but you have got to receive. But if you don't perceive it, You will not believe it, and you will never receive it. This is Bible 101. Now, I know religious thinking is starting to fret and reason, go, well, I'm not sure that all this talk about the Lord getting you stuff and things and business deals and money is really what we should be talking about. Well, you don't don't think so, do you? Hmm. Well, if you don't learn how to have from God's word and according to his will, you will resort to envy jealousy, manipulation, striving, hoarding, stinginess, greediness, maybe even corruption and stealing. You don't believe me? I've seen people in ministry resort to these tactics and justify it because it's for the greater good. That's a lie from hell. Pastor, God will grow your congregation as you trust him. You don't need to be jealous, envious, competitive, or worse. Try to knock the other pastor down. The word of God, the Bible principle of how to have is the antidote to all these temptations of the flesh. God wants you to have, but his way, not by stealing or defrauding. J.P. Getty said this, my formula for success is rise early, work late, and strike oil. (laughs) Well, guess what? God planted all the oil in the world and he knows how to lead you. If you'll learn to PBR with intentionality, he will guide your drill in every single situation. Jesus and the disciples went on a boat trip to the other side of the sea. And when they got there, the disciples recognized they'd forgotten to pack a lunch. Oh no. They had no bread, no provision. So they began discussing their failure to plan and the fact that they were lunchless, foodless. Well, Matthew 16, starting at verse eight. But Jesus, aware of this said, you men of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves that you have no bread, no lunch? Do you still not understand or remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you picked up? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many large baskets you picked up? The Lord's reminding them of what they had a chance to perceive, God's provision. Jesus uses very little to feed very many. He uses a little to make a miracle of a lot. Would we even tell the story of the feeding of thousands of people if Jesus had this whole agricultural supply chain at the ready with transportation trucks full of food? No, absolutely not. We tell the story because Jesus modeled taking a very little to supply an unbelievably huge amount of food. It was miraculous. Matthew 14, starting at verse 14. Jesus saw a large crowd and he felt profound compassion for them and he healed their sick. When evening came, the disciples came to him and he said, this is an isolated place and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here except five loaves and two fish. Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people and they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets of the leftover broken pieces. There were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children. You know what? That's about 20,000 people. That's about 170 commercial restaurants jam-packed. Okay, so let's draw from Jesus supplying practical everyday needs. How to have good things step by step, just like Jesus, right? Here we go. Number one, take the vision. Jesus simply said, don't send them away. You feed them. Jesus will often give us a word or a directive that seems impossible. But you start with the vision and the mission that God gives you. Remember, with God, all things are possible, but you must get your eyes full of that vision. See it. Don't look away, but see the need and the need being met. 
Number two, take inventory. Jesus asked them in the Mark 6 account, what do you have? Notice the disciples answered here, we have nothing here except five loaves and two fish. These guys were established not-havers. And they were good at slanting their report with a not-haver emphasis. They had an attitude about the little bit of food they had. In life, you have to learn to take inventory of what you have. Don't be dishonest. Don't exaggerate either way. God, who legally owns everything, is interested in your ability to steward. So if he gives you a little... He's not as much interested in the quantity as he is in the quality of your regard for it. Are you dismissive? Are you scornful of the little? Do you despise the pennies, the little opportunities, the people that you think are insignificant and can't promote your cause? The first step in the PBR principle is perceive. Taking inventory is recognizing, but it's also having respect for the seed, celebrating what God has already entrusted to you, which is a perfect setup for the next step. After you take inventory, look at what Jesus said to them to do next. Take it to God. That's what he said in verse 18. Bring them here to me. If you knew God would multiply all the good stuff that you have, then wouldn't you be very quick to bring it to him? When you have a great vision and a tiny bit of provision, you've got a big choice to make. Either hoard your five loaves of bread and despise the impossibility of the dream that'll never happen, or bring it all to God and let Him help you multiply it. Practically speaking, how do we translate this action? How do we take it to God? In the Mark 6 account of this story, Jesus praised God for the supply and gave thanks as he broke and divided up the bread. Jesus lifted it up to heaven and blessed it. He valued it before God. Think of this. Jesus was thankful for those five loaves. What are you thankful to God for today? Now that's having. And then number four, take action. Jesus told the disciples to have everybody sit down on the grass in anticipation of supply. Mark 6 says he specifically told them to sit down in ranks of hundreds and fifties like a garden. Jesus instructed them to get the plan going and bring some order to the situation. A miracle is about to happen, and yet once again, Jesus is telling them to act on what they can do, what they do have, where they are, not where they wish they could be. Take action on Jesus' words with what you do have, not what you don't. Jesus didn't tell them to take out a loan. I'm not saying a loan is a bad thing, but Jesus was about to amplify what they had, not what they didn't have. You've got to be a haver on this step. God multiplies what you have, and that goes into how well you've learned the art of perceiving, believing, receiving. Let me remind you at this point, Jesus always told the people that he healed, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has healed you, saved you, restored you. All these people received because they were havers. They had perceived, believed, and received. Not because they were good people, righteous, or pretty people. Not because they had fame, money, or influence. They were havers. And then number five, take up the harvest. You're not done. Don't just stay in the sandwich stage. Don't just get your miracle, wipe your mouth, and go on with your life. We've got too many Christians who think the conference was the goal. Life is the goal, my friend. Living the abundant life in Christ is the goal. His glory is the goal, and the win is not in the miracle sandwich. No, God is always outcome-minded, stewardship-minded. What did you do with the little he entrusted to you? Did you just eat it all up? No. The secret to glorifying God is the many baskets that you pick up after the miraculous feeding. God has no problem multiplying the bread. The real variable here is, are you willing to fill those harvest baskets full? What remains after the crowd? After the event, after the dance, show me the harvest. The well done God rewards you for is not eating his sandwiches. It's for harvest, the harvest, the outcome. This is the take that is all about the give. Take, take, and then take and take. 
but it's all God's way, not the world's selfish way. God really wants you to have good things. Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Oh, that's good. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Oh, praise the Lord. God provides. He's not even telling the rich that it's bad to be rich because it's not. He's saying, put your trust in in me. Put all your trust in God. That's the main thing. Maybe you're already working the PBR principle to have financial wealth, but you need to work it to have abundant life, to have joy. Work the principle to have peace, happiness, wisdom. Work that principle to have a faithfulness in your relationships, loyalty, honesty. Where do we start with that? You start by perceiving recognizing that Jesus is the Lord. He died for all of your sins, paid the price for your healing, bore the chastisement that purchased your peace. See that. Recognize and perceive that He alone is the way, the only way to eternal life. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you to save me. You've already paid the price for me. You died on the cross. You rose up from the grave. You promised me everlasting life. I see it now. God loves me. Forgive me of all my sins, Lord. Come into my heart. Now I'm a child of God. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.